So that's all the sets done. We'll go inside and have a look at the results. Big shout out to Insta360. They've kindly offered to sponsor this video with a go-to action camera so I can bring you more on the bike content rather than just talking in the bike cave the whole time. For this video, I mostly use the magnetic style pendant mount, which I'll be using going forward. It's actually much smaller, much neater, and pretty much invisible compared to the GoPro style mount. And in addition to that, I used a couple of on-bike mounts to monitor the suspension behavior, but more on that later. Editing the footage in the app is really pretty simple as well. And there's a link in the description below if you want to know more about the camera. So hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now recently another cycling YouTuber called Dylan Johnson put out a video where he presented some data regarding climbing on a mountain bike with the suspension open versus closed, so locked out. And in that video he basically came to the conclusion that leaving the suspension open there was no real penalty in terms of climbing times versus locking out the suspension with a lockout switch for the same given power. And this got me thinking, well why is that? And how can that be? Because from experience, I know that climbing on a long travel suspension bike with a mushy rear end, it feels really inefficient and surely it has to be slower. So I thought, well, I'll write to Dylan and I'll offer to repeat his test protocol on my bike, which is a much longer travel Enduro bike. So my bike's got a 140 rear end and a 150 mil fork. And I thought maybe, you know, him being a lightweight guy with a very smooth pedaling technique, maybe there's just not enough suspension movement in his bike to really exaggerate those time losses or show any like energy transfer in the shock. On to the final set now. God, I forgot how long this is going to take to do all these runs. Now before we get into the test protocol and the results and we discuss all the physics behind this, um, let's just take a little look at what a rear suspension unit does. And in this video we're only going to consider really the rear shock because that's what Dylan was talking about and that's what the white papers in his video were talking about also. Now a rear shock on a mountain bike or on a car, on a train, on an F1 car, normally comprises of a spring and a damper. Now, if you think about a coil shock, like on a long travel mountain bike or a downhill bike or something, you can think of that coil as pretty perfectly elastic. So whatever kinetic energy you give into it, most of, most of that you're gonna get back. The damper side of the shock um, is responsible for an energy transfer. So this is why I'm so puzzled at, at Dylan's results is that surely if you put energy into a damper with kinetic energy you basically transfer your kinetic energy into kinetic energy of the viscous damping fluid which gets transferred to heat as well so there is an energy transfer there and you're not going to get everything you put in and that works for if you've got compression damping on the shock and also rebound damping so every time you push the shock forward and it rebounds back there's an energy transfer uh, to kinetic energy of the damping fluid and also some a small amount of heat as well now if you think about coil shocks versus air an air shock is actually in theory worse because as you compress the air chamber the air chamber actually heats up and you can feel that on an air shock the can gets hot and that energy is lost to the surroundings so you've got an energy transfer from the can with the heat of the can and you've also got an energy transfer in the damping fluid like we said before so it can't be perfectly efficient it just can't now it's too easy to think as as humans that we put out a smooth power profile it just isn't like that so we're basically a very lumpy engine, uh, a reciprocating engine with two pistons. We put out, with, with our two legs, two peak torque cycles per revolution. You can basically model this as a sine wave. And I've given you a quick graphic here of a sine wave, like what, what a torque cycle might look at of one pedal revolution. We can see the peak torque cycles are when the crank is horizontal and the minimums are 90 degrees away from that. And actually when we stand up, uh, we that peak torque angle, that crank angle slightly lags 90 degrees and the, the peak torque for the same power will actually be slightly higher if we're standing up. So why am I mentioning this? Well, I want to talk about anti-squat and this is quite an important thing to understand we're talking about pedal efficiency. So what is anti-squat? Well, in any vehicle, whether it be a dune buggy, a rally car, an F1 car, a motorcycle, a motocross bike or a mountain bike, the suspension linkage is a balance of all different characteristics of suspension. It could be, first of all, the rear wheel travel, how much travel you want the thing to have. It could be the leverage ratio, that depends on like your shock tune and your spring rate. So how much leverage the rear wheel has on the shock. It depends on things called anti-dive, anti-rise, anti-squat, chain growth, pedal kickback. Okay, some things don't have pedal kickback if they're not you know, driven by pedals, but there are at least kind of four or five really important characteristics when designing a suspension system for any vehicle. 
and they all kind of tie in with each other and if you you make one better you make one a little bit worse and they're quite hard to separate so in bikes anti-squat is the resistance of the rear triangle moving up and compressing the suspension when there's an acceleration so your center of gravity moving back and don't forget because we're not a smooth engine we're not like an electric motor that which puts out constant torque we have this very large sinusoidal torque output Every time we push on the pedals, there's a rearward movement of our center of gravity due to our inertia and the acceleration of those pedals. So bike designers put something into rear suspension design called anti-squat. And what does that do? Well, it actually uses the chain and the chain tension, which we know is sinusoidal, to prevent that suspension compressing. Now, depending on the linkage design and where the pivot points and the swing arm pivots line up, you can actually use the chain tension to extend the rear linkage or we can actually get it to compress it. If you get it to extend the rear linkage, that's 100% anti-squat or above. And if you've got less than 100% anti-squat when you pedal and your weight shifts back, the linkage will compress. Now for an XC bike or a trail bike or a very lightweight full suspension mountain bike that you want to pedal very well, you would have a high level anti-squat. So the chain tension really does open up that linkage when you stamp on the pedals. Something like a downhill bike, you've probably got less anti-squat. But we'll go into it for the physics geeks anyway. So what you need to do is basically join up the kind of virtual pivot point of the two linkages in the suspension. It's very easy for a single pivot bike. It will just The rear wheel will just rotate about that single pivot and that's your instantaneous center or that is the swing arm pivot. But if you've got a multi-link rear suspension or a multi-link suspension on any vehicle, um, you need to find what's called the virtual pivot point or the swing arm pivot or the instantaneous center. And that is depicted by this gra graphic here. You can see the two linkages give you this kind of virtual swing arm pivot where the rear wheel rotates about. And on a bike like mine with the VPP on Santa Cruz, that virtual pivot point actually changes throughout the travel. So you get different characteristics of anti-squat, anti-rise, anti-dive, blah, 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 depending on the how much travel you're going through the bike. So after you found that swing arm pivot, that virtual pivot point in space, how do you find the level of anti-squat of the system? Well, the next thing to do is see where the chain uh, tension vector intersects that swing arm pivot. And that will tell you a great deal about if the chain is trying to open the linkage or it's trying to close the linkage under the chain tension that you're giving it when, you, when you're pedaling. Now, you can probably guess pretty quickly that that chain tension vector changes depending on the chain ring size and what cog you're in at the back. So the angle of the chain and the position of that intersect will change depending on your gear ratio. So it's very hard for a bike designer to cover all their bases to say, right, we want anti-squat in this gear, we want high anti-squat in this gear. You can't really, you have to kind of pick a gear ratio you think people are gonna be climbing in the most and set your anti-squat characteristics for that. Now, again, anti-squat is generally optimized for the sag point. So when your weight in, is stay on suspension, the anti-squat is kind of designed in at the highest point for when the shock is under sag, just from when you're pedaling. There's no point designing the highest anti-squat when the shock isn't loaded because you can't ride the bike without any weight on it. And secondly, most bike designers will design the anti-squat for a seated position. And why is that important? Well, if you stand up, your in most in most cases your your center of gravity will go up and forward now the forward part's not so important but if your center of gravity goes up the bike's ability to resist the suspension squatting decreases there's a higher moment rotating about the rear wheel and you naturally get less anti-squat if your center of gravity has gone up so again they have to pick the center of gravity they think is right for the right weight of rider the right height of rider so it's actually quite a difficult thing to get right on full suspension design bikes if you've got a bike with more than 100% anti-squat, when you pedal, the linkage will actually extend. So although it's not compressing and bobbing, if you've got any rebound damping set up on the shock, that will be damping, that will be giving you an energy transfer and an energy loss when you extend the shock. And then as you back off the pedals, your weight goes forward a little bit again on that, on that trough of the sine wave, and then the shock will compress. If there's any compression damping, again, you're losing energy to the oil. So it has to be less efficient. And just to quickly su summarize, I do expect the standing times to be slower because if we look at the kind of anti-squat little vectors I've represented with these arrows, we've got a much larger anti-squat figure when we're seated versus standing just because our center of gravity has gone up when we're standing. So I do expect the standing times to be slower. Whether we can separate that from aerodynamic losses, that's gonna be really hard to tell. Now getting on to the test. So the test, oh, it's a longer than expected because I had to do 12 climbs, I think it was. So I did three 
blocks, each with four runs in each block. So I did locked out seated, a locked out standing, and then a open seated, and then open standing. I picked a day where the wind was pretty low, the conditions were good, everything was controlled, there was no traffic, there's no cars on this climb, so I could get a very controlled, consistent power output and times on every run. The power I was targeting was 300 watts. I used the same cadence when I was seated for all the seated runs, and I used a different cadence, but the same cadence for all the standing runs as well, to keep everything as consistent as possible. So hi everyone, this is run number one. Got to do 12 runs now. Thanks Dylan. Kind of regret signing up for this now, but I'm gonna try and hold 300 watts on each run. The climb's about 5%. Should be three to four minutes on this bike at this power. So I've got my lap power and my instant power displayed on the Garmin so I can make sure I'm averaging the same on each run. This is locked out standing number one. This is open seated one. Standing run one now. Open standing run one now. Let's go on with round two. Twelve of these to do. That's set number two done. Now I'm on to the final block of four. All right, over 60 minutes at 300 watts. I didn't really calculate how long this would take, but interesting results actually. Now, lo and behold, what, what happened? Well, I think the mean power is 302, plus or minus kind of two watts, plus or minus two watts. I can't really look into that because we're getting down to the accuracy of the power meter. There is no time difference between open shock and locked out shock. I couldn't quite believe it. If we look at the table here, we can see the standing position is about nine seconds slower in both cases. That's probably most of it an aerodynamic penalty. It might be to do with the less anti-squat because coming from the onboard footage here, we can see the rear suspension squatting a lot more when I'm standing than when I'm seated in the open position. When I'm seated in the open position, the anti-squat seems to be working really well and I'm hardly getting any bob. When I'm standing, we can see the shock is way more active because I'm using a higher peak torque uh, because I'm standing with a lower cadence for the same power and I've also got less anti-squat because my centre of gravity is a little bit further up. Now if we look at the graph um, we can see that yes in block three so in run three of open, locked and seated and standing there across the board the times got a bit quicker and I did notice on the day that the third block of runs um, there was a bit of a tailwind that had got up in in the late morning and but all the consistency the grouping was was pretty much exactly the same the trend was exactly the same at, uh, at iso power an open shock if you're measuring power at the crank and we'll get onto this an open shock is the same as a locked out shock for your mechanical power output only so why wasn't there a time of difference between the open shock and the locked runs and why did it feel so much harder when the shock was open particularly when the shock was open and i was standing up well here's the answer and this is the crux of it if you measure the power between the crank or the pedals and the rear wheel, that power meter doesn't see anything happening kind of upstream of that. The power meter doesn't measure the metabolic cost of producing the power. It only measures your output power. And don't forget, you as a human, you are like an engine, you have an efficiency. So just because the times are more or less the same across all the different runs at 300 watts, it doesn't mean that each run had the same metabolic cost or physiological cost on my body. I can guarantee my efficiency was going down when the shock was open and I was stood up. Particularly when I was stood up, I felt like I was fighting the front fork a lot, which I didn't have locked out but kept consistent in all the runs. And that definitely wasn't contrib contributing to power at the crank, so I'm burning more calories there. The only way to measure the metabolic cost or physiological cost of something like this is to do gas analysis in a lab, and you can't, you can't do that outside feasibly on a climb. So, and this goes back to like time trialing. Or, or or your road bike fit or anything like this, is that okay, you can do 300 watts, right, in a different position, but what is the cost of doing that 300 watts? So if you're, let's say, changing a bike fit on your TT bike, and you think, oh, okay, I can do 300 watts in, a, in, a, in an aero position, but what is the cost of that? How many more calories are you burning from one position to the other to hold that position? And it's the same with the mountain bike. So yes the mechanical output will give the same time because it's only look that power meter is only looking between the crank and the rear wheel it doesn't care really what is happening upstream with that how much the suspension is bobbing how much you're leaning the bike over when you're stood up um, the associated rolling resistance addition with that is quite high i think 
Um, it doesn't measure how much you're fighting the front fork or how much stress you're putting in your upper body, trying to control the bombing and the suspension. So yeah, it's kind of an, an uninspiring answer really, but of course, with it kind of dawned on me that of course, with the power meter at the crank, all the times are gonna be the same, more or less. Now, an analogy would be, if you just look at a car engine, so a car engine has an input energy and an output energy, or an input power and an output power. Now, a Toyota Yaris, a GR Yaris, can produce 250 brake horsepower, and an AMG V8 can produce 250 horsepower, but they don't have the same efficiency. The V8 has to burn more fuel to get the same power because it's less efficient. And that's kind of an analogy what I'm trying to get to with the bike is that just because I can do the same out power output with an open shock versus locked or seated versus standing, it doesn't mean that the cost to me in terms of fuel is the same. Now, another very telling thing of this whole metabolic cost thing is that normally on a road bike when I'm climbing, um, I often see, for ISO power cases, I often see a slight drop in heart rate. Like, I actually find it a bit more relaxing to get out the saddle and climb for a bit and I can see in intervals at ISO power my heart rate will drop a couple of beats per minute. Conversely on the mountain bike, like we can see from this graph, all my standing intervals were consistently higher heart rate by quite a lot for the same power. So that is a telling, telling piece of evidence to show that the standing efforts for the same power had a higher metabolic cost. I'm requiring more oxygen and having a higher heart rate to do the same output power because I'm doing things with my upper body. I'm fighting the front fork, I'm leaning the bike right to left and trying to control the bobbing of the suspension, which has got less anti-squat, anti so I've got more to do with my body. So it all comes back to metabolic cost. So the only way to prove this, sorry Dylan, is gas analysis in a lab. There is no difference in the locked times versus open shock times at ISO power. That's how it is. For the seated position, the anti-squat on this bike at least, very effectively cancels out most of the bobbing. And there's a clear time penalty for the standing efforts. Most of that I think is aerodynamic, but and there's also the reduction in anti-squat with your center of gravity going up, which will make the suspension bob a little bit more. But that's those two things, like I said, are quite hard to separate. There was a clear higher metabolic cost of having the shock open. Having the shock open felt much harder to do the same power, although the times were the same, and the standing efforts definitely had a higher metabolic cost to do the same power. And I will say this, and I want this to be kind of the final message to everyone who has a power meter, that power meters only measure mechanical output. We have no real measure yet, day to day, of how efficient we are as an engine. Um, and so just because you can put out 300 watts in one position or one bike fit or one suspension setup doesn't mean that it's not costing you more in terms of energy and metabolic cost than another position or another suspension setup might do. And finally, thank you to Insta360 for sponsoring this video. All of the on-bike footage was shot using the Insta360 Go To camera. I had one mounted on my chest, one mounted on the handlebars, and I had a mount just above the rear shock, and I had a mount on the seat tube as well. So all of the on-bike footage and Riding footage you saw in this video was shot using that camera. It's so light at 26 grams, you basically just don't know you're wearing it. And I do actually have a dedicated camera review on the GoTo camera on my channel. So I'll put a link to that in the description below. And I'll also leave my link to the camera in the description below too. And it's a much neater solution, in my opinion, to wearing a GoPro on your body with a big kind of GoPro harness. Cheers, and I'll see you in the next one.